I want to cover today is three basic topics, give you an idea of what the infrastructure looks like in the United States, our multitude of challenges with our infrastructure, and one step that FEMA is taking by creating a new grant program that I'm responsible for, which is aptly titled Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. So altogether, infrastructure in the United States has an estimated value of around $37 trillion. On top of that, we also can see from this graphic that it is the third largest um, employer sector in the United States. It basically is responsible for about 11% of the United States employment structure. So about 11% of Americans work in some field of infrastructure. On top of that, we have found that for every dollar invested in infrastructure can have a return of up to $3 on our gross domestic product. Even though with all those benefits, the American Society of Civil Engineers in 2017 conducted what they called um, an infrastructure report card. And this was based on a scale that is typically used in American schools, that A was exceptional, B was good, C was mediocre, D was poor, and F was failing. Overall, across the 16 sectors that they studied of infrastructure in the United States, they gave us a rating of D+, which means infrastructure in the United States goes between mediocre and poor, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. So why is this? Well, there are several things that are leading to this cause. One is we do have an aging infrastructure in the United States. Um, it is that, of course, affects our ability to, um, it's more susceptible to hazards and affects our ability to recover and respond. We also have declining public spending in, the infra in infrastructure. So it's looking at this graphic. From 1967 to 2009, we went from basically spending 2.5 of our gross domestic product on infrastructure down to 1.7%. That's been further dropped down to about 1.3%. So we are seeing right now a steady decline in spend, public spending in infrastructure. And this has a real cost to our citizens in the United States. It is estimated that to get that score up to a B, which would be good, between 2016 and 2025, we need to invest about $4.6 trillion into our infrastructure. On top of the aging and the lack of public spending, those are not our only challenges. As I've heard others say, we too have issues with changes in development, population, and land use patterns. Particularly, in 2017, about 95 million people, or 29% of the U.S. population, lived in a coastal, coastline county where sea level rise and hurricane impacts are most dire, and that's a 15% increase since 2000. We also have the out west, the wildland urban interface, where wildfire is the largest danger, is seeing a dramatic increase in development as well. From, two, from 1990 to 2010, we went from 31 million to 43 million homes, which represented a 41% increase. And lastly, we have changing weather conditions. So if you look, let me see if I can make the pointer work, up here in Boston, so the state of Massachusetts, for example, is saying by 2050, they anticipate sea level rise increasing by 0.65 meters. And that will have an impact on their infrastructure of $463 billion. Nationwide, if I look at the, the issues coming out of Severe precipitation, water scarcity, snow melt, and sea level rise. I can anticipate that just in the wastewater utilities and water utilities, we will have damages of $944 billion. And of course, we're seeing a dramatic increase in what the impacts of disasters are um, costing us. So because of, if you look at the changing population dynamics, the changing climate, basically we are seeing the cost increase um, from 
all the way up to um, 2017. And as we look at multi-billion dollar events, from 1980 to 2018, we were having about six billion, multi-billion dollar events a year. But if I look at just between 2014 and 2018, that number goes up to 12 multi-billion dollar events a year. As an example, this is just 2017, which is our costliest disaster year so far in the United States. We had 16 multi-billion dollar events that year, costing $306 billion. That was a new record over 2005 when our disaster costs were about $215 billion. The ones that caused the biggest were, of course, The wildfires in California and our three hurricanes, um, Hurricane Harvey striking the state of Texas, Hurricane Maria striking the state of Florida, I'm sorry, Hurricane Irma striking the state of Florida, and Hurricane Maria striking the U.S. territories of um, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I wanted to give you all a photographic representation of some of those disasters. Um, because I think sometimes that has a larger impact than just the numbers. So in the upper left, that is a neighborhood in California after a wildfire. In the upper right, that's the city of Houston in Texas, which is the fourth largest city in the country, which sat under about 43 inches of rain that fell in a couple of days. This is some of the after effects of Puerto Rico and the hurricane that hit there, as well as that's Florida, and two more in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So one thing that is really, that has happened in the United States that really helps us is we do learn from these disasters after they occur. And typically what we see is legislation that comes forward that supports the emergency management community. Starting in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina, 2012, with Hurricane Sandy, and most recently, the three big hurricanes from 2017 that created the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018, which created the BRIC program, which I'm very excited about. Um, first, because it got me a job up in DC, and I, as a 20-year mitigator, um, I am so excited. I've been implementing programs for 20 years, and they've now hired me to a design one. So what we're hoping to do is create a pre-disaster mitigation program that will support our states, our tribal um, partners, which is our Native Americans, our territories, and our communities. One thing that really makes BRIC different is FEMA has two different programs that fund mitigation or resiliency products projects in a post-disaster setting. This is the first time that we've had funding that is consistent on a pre-disaster setting. So what we've been doing since this act um, was approved in October of 2018 is engaging with our stakeholders. That led to FEMA's largest engagement to date um, with over 5,000 comments derived by a series of sources and 75 different letters from agencies, other federal agencies, non-governmental organizations, and states. Right now, we are in the, our timeline is that we are hoping to go to public comment on the policy that we've created and the program design decisions in the spring with a rollout of the program in September of 2020. We have come up with six guiding principles of the program that we are taking into program design. The first is support communities through cap cap capability and capacity building. Um, that it comes to me from not just building resilient infrastructure, but also building resilient communities. We know that that's one of the primary needs is to make sure our communities are supported. The second thing we wanna do is to encourage and enable innovation that was one of the things we saw back from the comments is people ask, okay, but what do you mean by infrastructure? What do you mean by resiliency? So right now we are creating a mitigation action guide that will 
give examples to all kinds of communities because I have very rural to very urban. Um, what resiliency projects look like, what we're actually, in, what innovative solutions to resiliency will look like. And we hope to deliver that along with the program. Of course, we want to promote partnerships. Um, we know that communities cannot do this on their own, and also, we also know that our dollars are never going to be big enough to solve all the infrastructure problems. So we want to help communities figure out how to build partnerships. This hopefully will in enable large projects. So what we're getting for funding is 6% of all disaster costs in the US. So when a disaster happens, 6% of those disaster costs will go into a brick bank, and then annually we will have a competitive program to release those funds. We want to maintain flexibility. Because our program is 6% of disaster cost, we also could have large fluctuations from year to year in the funding we have available. For example, in 2012, if we'd had the BRIC program, we would have had about $63 million to spend. In 2017, if we'd had the BRIC program, we would have had over $3 billion to spend. And then we want to provide consistency. It's very important to our stakeholders who have been participating in our grant programs for 20 years that some things are similar, and this, of course, is also a consistent source of funding. We have found that for every dollar we spend in the U.S. on hazard mitigation or resiliency products, product, we see six dollars in return, and that does go up in coastal communities to seven. I want to show you a picture of two different projects that we um, are thinking about as innovative solutions in the BRIC program. The project on the left is in Hoboken, New Jersey. And basically, that's a very urban area that's a suburb of New York City. So this is in the middle of town. And basically, it offers flood storage underneath and an urban um, green space on top. So they are taking one of the things that we would like to see more in BRIC, which is nature-based solutions, and putting it into their project design. We also like this project because it is FEMA-funded, but it only, it's a $47 million project, but FEMA is only contributing $10 million of it. Typically, we fund 75% of any projects. So Hoboken went out and found $37 million of other people's money to match with FEMA. So that's the kind of partnerships we're talking about. Another project, if I move all the way to the West Coast in a much smaller community, is from one of our Native American um, partners. So this is Blue Lake Rancheria in Northern California, extremely rural, extremely remote area. And they basically have created a microgrid system that provides them energy resiliency. They're, they're in an area that has increasing wildfire, and because of that, the electric company in that area will, will actually turn off power for days um, to try to prevent wildfires. Well, that then leaves the community with no power. So they've created a way to basically snap off the grid, and they did it with a series of partners at universities and private sector. It's a mix of solar power arrays, batteries provided by Tesla, um, and generators. They have a hotel that can convert to a hospital. They have refrigeration for medical. They have solar panel arrays on their gas station. Um, and they are the only ones in the community. So when the, when the power snaps off, they not only serve their tribal or Native American population, but they actually benefit the entire community that surrounds them. They actually got to experience this in October of this year when the electric company shut off the power for 48 days. And they are credited with saving four lives by being able to hospitalize these people in their hotel and also providing all the gas and fuel for the responders that was needed in the county. The second part of building resilient communities. The graph on the right represents that we have to be able to partner with others because a large sector of the infrastructure in America is not owned by the federal government or state and local. 40.7% 40, 40 
is owned by the private sector. So we think that it's important that the communities be involved in a planning process that involves the whole community, not just the governmental elements. Thank you.